you go first. You go ahead. Go right here in the front. Hello, my name is Kathy McLaughlin. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Politics, and I want to welcome you all here tonight. Um, the forum is the premier arena for political discussion and debate at, the for at, at Harvard, so we're happy that you're here to join us. For those of you who are new to the forum, we bring in, we have opportunities to hear from heads of state, political activists, journalists, and what we can do is following the discussion with these panelists, we'll then have an opportunity for you to join the discussion as well. Um, my job tonight is to introduce Jill Doherty, who's our moderator for the panel tonight. Jill is currently at the Woodrow Wilson International Center in Washington, D.C., but prior to that, she was here as a fellow at the Kennedy School. And with, as a fellow here, she did a lot of research on Russia, so we're thrilled to have her back. And she keeps saying she'll keep coming back, so we're going to keep asking her. And Jill will actually introduce our moderators tonight, I mean, our panelists tonight, and we'll um, moderate the discussion and then open it up to you at the end. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Kathy. Um, this is a great event. I'm really glad that I'm here. And I think we're, we're going to have a really interesting night. About 35 minutes or so, we'll talk. And then 35 minutes or so, we'll have questions. And I know there are a whole lot of questions. Let me start. Um, we have, from to my left, is Masha Alyokhina, member of Pussy Riot. Nadia Talakonnikova, right there also, of course. I think you all know them. And sitting in tonight is uh, Nadia's um, husband, Peter. Peter is Peter Virsilov. He's a member of the art collective Vaina, which means war. And he's sitting in kind of at the last, I hope. I mean, is there another meaning of Vaina? <laughs> I think no, another meaning. OK. Um, anyway, Peter's going to sit in as translator because we wanted this to be really, really lively. And uh, he's used to hearing these women speak. So he's going to be translating. Um, uh, very briefly, I think you all know a bit of the history of Pussy Riot. Um, February 2012, they had a protest in one of the major cathedrals in Moscow, Christ the Savior Cathedral. They performed a song, which of course you can see on YouTube, which was called uh, Mother of God, Drive Putin Out. Uh, a type of prayer, a type of performance, which of course got them arrested. Um, they were uh, convicted of hooliganism, which is a technical term in Russia. It sounds kind of funny, but it's, it's a real word. Hooligans. So these are two hooligans right here. And they were sentenced to two years in a penal colony. Um, they, went, they went off to their colonies. They uh, went on hunger strikes. And then they were released in December of last year. Remember that the Sochi Olympics were coming up, and the Kremlin was showing its magnanimity by uh, releasing prisoners. And both uh, Nadia and Masha were released and uh, came back. So that's a short history. Um, I want to start by asking about the name. I mean, how can you avoid asking about this name? Pussy Riot. Um, why in English? Why did you decide you name yourselves in English? Why not say Pussy Riot in Russian? And uh, why the word pussy? Мы с самого начала хотели, чтобы Pussy Riot стали интернациональным движением. Особенно нам сейчас приятно было видеть, как политики и журналисты произносят название этой группы. Если бы они ограничились только русским языком, было бы не так весело. Well, from the start, we wanted Pussy Riot to be an international movement. And uh, it's especially uh, good nowadays that politicians and uh, people from uh, international governments, when they use that term, that's especially nice. I think if the <laughs> term would be in Russian, it wouldn't be as fun as it is right now. Well, it am amused President Putin. If you also want to look at a video, you can see President Putin talking about that very word. But we will go on. Um, so you're here. You're in the United States right now. Um, why are you here? Are you traveling now internationally? 
Is that your mission to travel internationally? Nadia? Я бы не назвала это нашей миссией. Почему так громко? Нет, мы просто из той традиции людей, которые, в общем, не привыкли замечать границы. Поэтому для нас достаточно важно разговаривать с людьми, и мы не ограничиваемся одной лишь Москвой. Мы путешествуем как по российским регионам, так и по тем местам, которые не входят в состав Российской Федерации пока. Well, and I would use the loud word mission to describe what we're doing right now. And we're the sort of, we're from the, uh, as you can say, the breed of people who don't really like to recognize international borders too much. So we like to travel a lot, and like to uh, talk to people around the world, and even in places that are not Russian Federation yet. <laughs> That's a, a sad joke right. here. But wait, let's just find out. You can go back. Right? You can travel freely? Yes, we, we spend more time in Russia than do, in Europe. You do or you don't? We are living in Russia. We do. Most time is okay. spent in Russia. Yeah. Mostly in Russia. Ну как мы путешествуем, как все люди проходим таможенный досмотр, предъявляем паспорта, ничем в этом смысле не отличаемся от других. Yeah, we travel like all usual people. They check our passports, we go through customs, and in this in this sense, we don't differ from any other Russians who travel back and forth. No, мне кажется, стоит заметить, что такая ситуация, она в каком-то смысле особенная. Многие из тех людей, которые считаются и являются российской оппозицией после известных событий в Крыму, когда они приезжали в аэропорт на таможенной границе, ФСБ брала не только отпечатки их пальцев, но в частности вот просила их предъявить слюну. И... But funny things can happen in this situation. For example, uh, the, especially after the Ukrainian situation, after the annexation of Crimea, the uh, Russian security service, the FSB, started very closely examining people from the Russian opposition who are returning to Russia. And not only they have been taking fingerprints, which they didn't do before, but they've also even been taking samples of people's spit, which has been happening from time to time nowadays. So this is an awkward situation. Their spit, in other words, saliva, yes. DNA. Okay. Could I ask, and, and I think this is something that a lot of the people in the audience want to know, how do you define yourself? I mean, I was thinking, you're feminists, you're sometimes described as punk rockers, you're uh, performance artists, you're political activists. You know, what are you? What, what really? Ну, вообще-то это очень удобная стратегия, особенно когда сидишь перед следователем. Он тебе задает вопрос, но он там, ты художник? Да нет, на самом деле я музыкант. Ну, музыкант, какую музыку ты играешь? Да нет, на самом деле я скорее, конечно, философ. Ну, какой философией вы увлекаетесь? Да нет, я, пожалуй, все-таки моя основная профессия это журналистика. Well, this is actually. Ты не можешь уходить от вопроса. This is actually a very comfortable strategy, especially, for example, when you're sitting in front of a police investigator and you're being asked, well, well are you an artist? Well, uh, no, most likely I'm more of a musician. Okay, then uh, what music do you play? Well, you know, in, in the end, I'm more of a philosopher. <laughs> oh, well, then what philosophy do you do? Well, you know, you'd have to probably stick with the artist answer. So it's, a, it's basically very uh, good tactics to avoid this question, and this is something in the nature of what we do. So you can't give a strict definition here. Okay. Well, мне кажется, чем мы не занимались от искусства до каких-то политических вещей, мы остаемся панками, и от этого как-то не удается уйти. But I think no matter what we do, from politics till uh, to art, we still try to we stay true to the punk nature that we really have. So we, it's even when we want to, it's very hard for us to avoid that. Вчера, например, мы сидели в какой-то луже в куче окурков на полу в Riot Fest. И к нам подошла женщина и спросила: "Собираетесь ли вы навестить Британию?" Мы говорим, ну да, собираемся в ноябре, мы собираемся пойти в британский парламент. И она аж села. В тот момент она просто британский си села на, на тот же пол и сказала, вы в британском парламенте. For example, yesterday we were in uh, Chicago finishing our time at Riot Fest. It's a musical festival down there. And we were uh, in an 
awkward situation. We were sitting uh, in some place with a lot of cigarettes, but around us. We were sitting the, on, in the floor, just on the you floor. Know, in the ground. And this, Not the and the and the woman approached us, and uh, she started a conversation, and she asked if uh, we ever traveled to or if we were planning to go to Great Britain. And we said yes, we do have plans to go there, and in fact, we we think we have plans to speak at the British Parliament. And then you have to see her face because at that moment when she saw us sitting on the ground around cigarette butts, she said, British Parliament, no. And she sat down and started talking in a whole different manner. But, but it's still, I think, a legitimate question. I mean, um, you formed your group with a purpose, I would presume, right? There must be some purpose. So what is that purpose? What, what do you want to do? No. Цель, собственно, была такой же, как и у большинства оппозиционных людей в России, в Москве. Это протестовать против Путина и сказать свое слово как можно ярче, как можно громче и сильнее. Потому что до выборов оставалось совсем немного времени, и мы, как часть, как либеральная часть России, действительно верили в то, что мы можем что-то изменить, что мы можем не допустить вот этого вот третьего срока, но... The main, the main goal of us forming the group was, it was obviously to, and first of all, was to protest Putin. We wanted to make a statement that would be as bright, as loud, and as effective as possible. And at that time, and that was the spring of 2012, we really had the uh, aspirations and the ideas that if people would protest and work hard enough and be loud enough, that there was a chance to avoid Putin's third term. Okay, but um, if you look at the polls, okay, I have to now, as we say, play the devil's advocate. Um, the polls for President Putin are somewhere around like 84, 85% support. Um, many Russians support the Russian Orthodox Church, and you carried out your first and most famous or infamous um, protest in a church. And there were a lot of people who were really, you know, bent out of shape or hurt by that, angry about it. So, um, you know, is, is, that, is there a way that you feel you can actually bring the people of Russia um, to your viewpoint if you insult them? Мне кажется, вот вы сейчас говорите из позиции такой ловушки, ловушки, когда Россия и россияне видятся миру такой консервативной массой. На самом деле все это не так. И тот рейтинг, о котором вы сейчас говорите, он вот, это свежий рейтинг. На тот момент, когда был создан Пусирайт, рейтинг Путина был около 60%. Было огромное количество людей, которые не хотели, чтобы он стал президентом. И... Well, you know, I think you're, uh you're using a certain trick here to basically really portray Russians as this conservative, very pro-Putinist mass. Those numbers were not, in fact, always as they are today. And uh, in 2012, when we were doing the action in the cathedral, Putin's polls were actually below and around 60. And there was a huge number of very active people who were actively against Putin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Понятно? Um, да, нет, абсолютно все понятно. Просто каждый раз, когда вы говорите о рейтинге Путина, нужно помнить о том, что 27% людей, согласно опросам, боятся, то, что они будут подвержены репрессиям в том случае, если они скажут, что это против Путина. And every time you mention the polls and Putin's popularity in Russia, you must remember that 20, that according to the polls, 21% of Russians think, 27% think that they will be punished if they give a wrong answer during a poll. Uh, второй пункт, uh, что uh, этот опрос действительно был uh, произведен после того, как Путин взял Крым, после того, как он вторгся в Украину, но еще до того, как пошли первые жертвы. И сейчас опросы показывают, что в связи с тем, что количество жертв российских солдат растет, uh, количество людей, которые против войны в Украине, возрастает. И сейчас оно порядка 4% уже. And another a very important thing to mention is that those polls you're talking about, the more than 80% were taken after Putin has uh, an ex-Crimean, after he's entered Ukraine, but before the first casualties started uh, to arrive from Ukraine and the first 
The Russian casualties. The Russian casualties, right. So after that, after that point, uh, there has been a steady growth in people who are actively against well, the Russian involvement in Ukraine, and now we could say this number is somewhere above 40%. So this popularity rating of Putin is something that, can, that rapidly changes. Ну, да, еще хотелось бы сказать <coughs> пару слов о, об отношении людей к церкви. А, тот момент, когда мы делали выступление в храме Христа Спасителя, примерно за месяц до этого туда привозили поезд Богородицы, а, известную реликвию, и была огромная очередь на много километров, на пять станций московского метро к этому поезду Богородицы. Люди стояли на холоде, приезжали автобусами из других городов, грелись чаем, который они приносили туда в термосах. Одновременно с этим на, собственно, по ВИП-пропускам приезжали чиновники, и возмущение, конечно, было огромным. И все это, да. And a very important thing to mention about the religiousness of Russians is uh, that several months before we did the performance in the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, a certain Christian relic was brought there. It's called the Belts of the Virgin Mary. And there were very long lines uh, of several kilometers standing for people to attend and see that relic. And at the same time, uh, officials and people in power were using VIP passes to cut the lines and see this Christian holy relic. And this did cause a significant amount of outrage among common people and among common believers who had to spend hours in the cold to see that relic. И в этом смысле, наверное, наша акция в храме Христа Спасителя это наиболее консервативная акция, которая когда-либо была у Пусирайт, потому что, собственно, то, что мы хотели сделать, это вернуть христианскую религию РПЦ к Христу. And in this sense, you can say that the action Pussyride did in the Cathedral of Christ the Savior is, what is the most conservative of Pussyride actions, because what we actually wanted to achieve during the course of that action is to take away Christianity from the official church and sort of give it back to Jesus. Другой момент, который хотелось бы сказать о религии. Есть в России большое количество россиян, которые гораздо более радикальны, нежели мы настроены по отношению к религии. Когда мы ехали с приговора, когда нам вручили нашу двушечку, мы ехали в автобусе оцепленным спецназовцами, мы были прицеплены каждый к спецназовцу, и вот один из наших спецназовцев сказал нам, Девки, я тоже против попов. Вы молодцы. Я здесь только для того, чтобы бороться с системой. Я вот выйду отсюда и, вот, уяснив, как она работает, буду бороться против нее. Встретимся на революции. Another important, another interesting thing about religion is that after we received our sentence, the two years we got from Putin, we were going back to our prison in a special bus guarded by a large and very powerful special forces convoy, and we were handcuffed to the railings inside the bus. And one of the guards, he leaned over and said, hey, girls, I'm completely with you. I'm really against the church people. I'm for the revolution. And once you're going to tell me what to do, I'm going to be right there on the barricades. <laughs> this was the uniform officer. Да, и мы таких людей встречали среди тюремных охранников, среди конвоиров в этих столыпинских вагонах, в которых нас перевозили по этапу. И вопрос просто заключается во времени. Во времени, в способе, в методе, который... Большинство россиян для себя не нашли, но это не отменяет того, что они на самом деле радикально против этой власти и просто ждут часа. So, and we really did, did meet people like that among uh, a lot of the uniformed people that we met during the past, during our time in prison under God, uh, among officers, convoy officers, uh, convoy officers and special trains that take prisoners from one region of Russia to another. So there really is a very big urge of, among ordinary Russians for change and even among people who serve the country for change and for uh, the country to look drastically different. But the problem is that the time is not right and people do not really yet see the right method for that change to happen and take place. So a small remark, for example, my first autograph I gave to a uniformed convoy guard while I was being transferred from one prison to another. Uh, <laughs> you know, could we talk about Putin? Um, <laughs> you're, uh, I, I want to know, obviously, you don't like him, <laughs> um, put, putting it simply, you do not like him. Why don't you like him? And I know this could go on, this could be a very long philosophical discussion, 
But I'm serious. What is the worst thing in your mind for which you, you know, uh, wh why you are against him? What is the, the worst thing in your estimation that he is doing to Russia? Well, to put it short, uh, a term that really can be easily translated to English is uh, the leaking of brains. So basically when people leave Russia and go to another country. Brain drain. Brain drain, right. Это происходит, происходило весь путинский срок, особенно начиная с того времени, когда он начал преследовать бизнес, преследовать Михаила Ходорковского. И теперь у нас новая волна миграции, волна разочарования, когда образованные люди, которые готовы строить бизнес, готовы <coughs> производить научные достижения, они просто покидают Россию, и мы остаемся ни с чем. This has been happening for Putin's whole terms in power, especially when he started prosecuting business, when he started jailing, the, when he started the court trial against Khodorkovsky, and people who are ready to open up a business, people with an education, they are often ready to leave Russia. And now there's a new wave of brain drain, of brain drain especially given the course of the actions of the Russian government in Ukraine. Репрессивных жестов и даже агрессивных жестов по отношению к ну, агрессивных жестов на внешнеполитическом уровне происходит, собственно, от, от паранойи. И если у власти стоит человек, который <coughs> управляет страной как КГБшным отделом, то мне кажется, сам образ такого управления не может быть найден симпатичным ни, ни для любого человека, который немного думает о своей жизни. And it's, it seems that, uh, obviously, if a person who is, uh, once he's on top of government power, when all his actions, all his international actions and all his internal actions are determined by paranoia, nothing can really, nothing good can come out of that. Because when a person really tries to govern the country and tries to do its international matters, like he's handling a small department in the KGB, I don't think anyone can find that approach to politics sympathetic. Would you ever leave Russia? Would you ever emigrate? We don't want to do it. <laughs> no. Mm. No. Mm. It's our <laughs> language, it's our culture. It's not culture of Putin and language of Putin. We yeah. don't want to give him it. Okay. Yeah. Even now we, we, we can't uh, leave our language. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful language. Um, so, so change, you do it in a revolutionary way, you do it with art, you do it with music, you do it in a lot of different ways. But um, politically, the opposition in Russia is very fractured. Um, it doesn't appear that there's anybody uh, on the scene who could really realistically um, compete with Vladimir Putin. Это не well, maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. У нас только что были выборы, небольшие выборы, но все равно выборы неплохо. <laughs> Это были выборы в Московскую городскую думу и то небольшое количество оппозиционных кандидатов, в частности такой кандидат как Михаил Кац, он смог набрать практически точно такое же количество голосов, как и человек от Единой России, у которого есть административный ресурс, финансовый ресурс от административного ресурса, который принадлежит к Единой России. Well, that's definitely not true, because we just had, for example, Moscow city council elections, and uh, there were a lot of opposition candidates which ran for them, and although uh, they, some, a few number of them did succeed, but, for example, we had some bright figures like Maxim Katz, who uh, was able to receive almost the same vote count as the candidate from the ruling United Russia Party, although he had no financial, administrative, or political resources, such as obviously the candidate supported by the ruling party. A year ago, the same result as the current mayor of Moscow, Sergei Sabanin, showed Alexei Navalny, who at the time was under the threat of the exclusion of the prison, and now he's currently under house arrest. Now he's 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 under house arrest. Exactly a year ago, a very popular opposition figure in Russia, Alexei Navalny, ran for mayor, and he received a very, very high result in those conditions. And now he's under house arrest, and he's facing further criminal charges, precisely for the reason that he's so popular and that he received such a significant success, although he got second place in last year's mayoral vote. Mm -hmm. You know, 
know, I, maybe I spoke too quickly in the beginning about being in prison, because you were in prison for two years in camps that are very far away. I remember Peter was in the CNN bureau uh, as you were about to go on a very long train ride to see Nadia. Um, you know, a long time in prison is pretty serious. Um, and you've started to, <laughs> again, I know there's a certain irony, but I'm trying to be <laughs> as you know, straight ahead as I can. But um, I, I, you know, when you, um, when you were in prison, I understand now that your focus is changing to prisoners' rights. That's one of the focuses that you are, uh, you're paying attention to, one of the issues that you're paying attention to. Can you tell us about that? Why prisoners' rights? What did you see in prison that made you want to work in this area? В тюрьме мы видели не только ужас, как только любят представлять в тюрьме, но в том числе и людей. И вот именно как раз то, что мы увидели этих людей, личностей, которые составляют нашу страну и которые готовы меняться, тех заключенных, которые администрация поставила на дирательный до мной, которые готовы были натянуть чулки на голову и кинуться на столы и танцевать вместе со мной. Что-то похожее на посирает. So in prison, we not only saw the horrors that people usually talk about, but also we saw personalities. We saw people, we saw real characters who were able to do brave things and be outspoken. And uh, some of those were put by the administration to guard me. But you know, it felt like they were ready to put on a balaclava on their head at any time, jump on the table and dance a song. Ну, вообще, форма, мне кажется, форма, армейская форма, тюремная форма, она что-то странное делать со сприятием человека. Человека видит каким-то другим, каким-то уже унифицированным и между вот обществом и, допустим, тюрьмой сейчас огромная стена. И вот даже ваши слова это подтверждают. Когда вы говорите о тюрьме, вы стараетесь быть серьезным. Но это не всегда правильно, потому что это как раз выстраивает ту самую стену и не позволяет разглядывать заключенных, в общем-то, абсолю абсолютно таких же людей. Well, you know, usually when people uh, talk about people in uniform and think about the problems of people in uniform, whether uh, police, military, or prison uniform, they tend to get serious because this, the whole subject of someone wearing or putting on a uniform really uh, sort of unifies you and objectifies you. Whereas even now you started talking about prison and prisoners and you already took a very serious sound. And sometimes this is not the right approach. You should just see prisoners and their problems as human problems, as problems that all of us might have. Все растет от личных отношений. Так же случилось и с нашей подругой Сесилем Акмион, которая провела немного меньше, чем мы, конечно, в тюрьме провела два месяца в Рейкерс Айленд за то, что участвовала в Occupy Wall Street. Но она успела близко познакомиться с некоторыми заключенными. Она нашла большую поддержку для себя там, и теперь они вместе с ней. Она уже освободилась, они изнутри хотят стоять за реформу тюрем. All goes from personal, all grows from personal experience. And for example, our friend Cecily McMillan, who went to Rikers Island in New York for uh, after participating in Occupy Wall Street and having some legal problems there, she had a very, she developed a very per close personal relationship with some of the prisoners down at Rikers Island. And now they formed a group to start fighting for prisoners' rights down there, and they're being very active and outspoken. And she's helping women down there be also very active and fight for their rights. So everything does grow from personal experiences and the way you can work and realize people as humans and help them do what they want to achieve. You know, um, Nadia, when we were back in the green room, you were saying that you can have uh, pussy riot groups all over the world, that there may actually be hundreds of them. Um, what does that mean? I mean, if let's say that I, I think of Pussy Riot as being specifically very Russian, but obviously you think it could exist anywhere. Obviously, you look at your face, <laughs> you don't agree. Um, could there be you know, a Pussy Riot collective here in the United States that would share something in common with... Oh, yes, do you know about it? Yeah, well, I, I, I do know that now. Well, um, there, there, is a, there is a Pussy Riot collective in America, probably if you, even if you don't know about it. Yeah, um, so, what, well, да, Tell me, I mean, what would unite them? What Мне кажется, я не знаю, как, как можно было... Почему Пусирайт выглядит как, как русская группа? Well, originally it was, correct? The question why Пусирайт looks like a Russian yeah. group to you. Okay. Well, what is it? Well, how could it exist in um, 
uh, Brazil, the United States, and Russia. What's the common thread? Ну, действительно, Витгенштейн очень сильно может в этом помочь своим термином семейного сходства, то, что вы не можете дать общие дефиниции по отношению ко всем явлениям, которые входят вот это вот, посирают семью. Well, you know, in this case, uh, the philosopher Wittgenstein can actually give you a term that really helps to define the situation here. He had this term said uh, family resemblance, which sort of gives you the appearance and the emotion that something is similar to each other, although you cannot really make out the clear definition of why one thing is close to another. Мысль Витгенштейна, мне кажется, очень поможет вам вообще понять, что такое пусирает. Есть люди, которые придумали пусирает. Есть человек, который родил какого-то другого человека. Но если ты родил какого-то другого человека, это не значит, что ты можешь его контролировать. Ты не можешь контролировать его внуков и тем более правнуков. Они живут сами по себе. И ты можешь умереть, и они будут жить. For example, there are people who created and who gave birth to Pussy Riot. Well, uh, humans give birth to humans, and a human cannot control what his son and grandchildren do after that. So Pussy Riot's fate is a lot like that. Ты не можешь уже исключить кого-то из своей семьи. Если кто-то что выросло, то выросло, как говорят у нас в России. And if someone is born, you cannot no longer exclude them from your family. As, we, as they say in Russia, what grew the thing that grew did grew. It's, it's a difficult expression to yeah. translate. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's go to questions, because I know people really want to ask some questions. So we have microphones. We have a lot of people up there. Um, where do we start? Let's see. Who wants to come up and begin some of the questions? All right. Yes, sir. Hi. My name is... Excuse me. Please identify yourself. Keep it brief and end with a question. Your ID. Yeah. ID. We want name, rank, serial number. My name is Malik Siraj Akbar. I'm a journalist from Pakistan and a master's uh, public administration student here. Sure. My question is, what do you think of Russia's decision to grant asylum to Edward Snowden? It's, it feels like in the midst of the Cold War between, the Soviet Union, uh, between Russia and America, human rights activists and feminists are in a way being manipulated. You can get a big audience here in the US, but it's hard for you to you know, speak back home in your country. Same happens to people like Edward Snowden. I'm personally an exiled journalist from Pakistan, but I think like we are all in a way becoming sandwiched in the hands of political entities. What do you think of it? Thank you. Мы не можем говорить там. Конечно, мы не можем использовать федеральные медиа, они все Путину принадлежат, но мы можем объединять вокруг себя людей, что, собственно, мы стараемся делать, и мы открыли свое медиа. И я не думаю, что... Я убеждена в том, что мы не находимся в России в абсолютной изоляции. И, опять же, вопрос времени, когда эта аудитория разрастется, you know, I don't think you can say that we're in absolute isolation in Russia in the, in the, and that we do not have a voice in Russia. Obviously, we do not have access to federal news outlets in Russia that are controlled by Putin. But that is the exact reason why we decided to open our own news outlet, which we recently did. And I think it's only a matter of time when things will become different, news outlets will appear and more voices will be heard. And things change quite quickly, for that matter. No, if we начали русские поговорки использовать, то у нас еще говорят вода камень точит. And since we've started to use Russian proverbs here, we also have the saying, the water, um, it's, it's always incredibly difficult to translate pro Just proverbs. Just examine for um, step by step him. Yeah. Water uh, changes the shape of a rock. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Hi, um, my name is Julia Coder Bellabordov. I'm with a group um, called Arts Against Aggression, and um, we have a question that that deals with your. We know about you. <laughs> yes, we, 
we read some some things to your <coughs> before. Okay, all right. So um, we have a question that is um, that deals with your rich experience of civil disobedience and taking on structures of overwhelming power and structure and stature. And obviously, in the U.S., we don't have um, similarly different sizes, but we have. Um, but we sometimes do find ourselves dealing with structures that seem quite a bit, quite huge and immovable. So as you know, a number of prominent Russian artists signed a letter supporting President Putin's policy on Ukraine and Crimea, and many of them continue to vocally support the regime now. And while the civilized world is ratcheting sanctions on the regime, major US institutions like Harvard continue to welcome Russian artists who use their artistic reputation to pop up the regime policies. Putin's regime rewards its loyal artists with money and support for their overseas tours, and then enhance, those tours enhance the reputations of these artists, and those reputations are then used to support the regime, including further erosion of civil liberties in Russia. Can, can we just and stop for two seconds? Is, it, is this understandable? Do you uh, that it's completely understandable. I think you don't need to uh, say all things because yeah. we know the maybe, subject. Maybe just I know. We can, uh, <laughs> I know you know. We're we trying wanted, for we the audience as well. And we can give you an answer. Uh, right. So we know so about our, uh, this uh, man. We know about uh, Roman Trgovitsky. Uh, we know that uh, he, um, he said uh, some things to Spivakov. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, we oh. think we think that um, Harvard can um, uh, can we invite uh, Spivakov uh, because uh, he invite us and uh, he, uh, Howard can invite Spivakov as well to listen all um, all to listen to all opinions. All opinions. So all, if all yes. opinions are heard, then both people from both but, sides can and but, should be invited. Uh, it's very strange, and we are really disappointed that uh, people like uh, Raman uh, are excluded from uh, Harvard or uh, banned. For, uh, from, ну, короче, что ему запретили посещение Гарварда из-за того, что он выразил свою позицию в достаточно корректной форме. We were quite disappointed uh, to hear about the fact Sorry. that Roman was banned from uh, visiting Harvard grounds for voicing his uh, disapprovement of Spivakov appearing on in Harvard in what we thought was an adequate and calm and correct form. И мы абсолютно, абсолютно свято убеждены в том, что нельзя никого банить, исключать и удалять за мирные, ненасильственные жесты, которые просто являются выражением позиции. And we really are completely and solidly sure that no one should be excluded, banned, or forbid from something for doing a non-violent expression of the opinion of the opinions they have. Okay, great. Um, yes. Hi there. Uh, my name's Sitsa Gofard. I'm a senior at the college, um, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. As you're well aware, um, you've become global icons uh, for um, civil liberties and freedom of expression in Russia. And I wanted to ask you, uh, were you at all surprised by that uh, global coverage and the global media attention that you received? And what was it about your movement in particular um, and your acts of of, of, I guess, in a way of um, civil disobedience as a, way, as, as a form of activism um, that made your movement so successful and so watched by the world media? We were surprised, of course, but we wanted to be us in different countries. Our movement is not just as a reason to criticize Vladimir Putin, but as a reason to ask our leaders what they should do, 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 well, uh, obviously we were to some extent surprised of what happened with Pussy Riot and the international attention that we got. But at the same time, we really want to see uh, people in other countries using the methods of Pussy Riot and using Pussy Riot as a way not only to criticize Putin and his policies, but as ways of holding their own governments accountable in their own countries. We think this is a much more productive and important strategy that people in their individual countries should have as an example from what Pussy Riot did. Всегда стоит помнить, когда вы говорите о Pussy Riot, что это только пример. Действительно, пример того, как какая-то небольшая горстка людей может что-то противопоставить своему правительству. Если вы считаете, что нам это удалось сделать, то вы можете это взять как форму высказывания для себя. Ведь проблема существует не только в одной единственной стране в мире, в России. Мы много были в разных странах мира после того, как мы освободились, и мы, в общем, видим, что 
проблем существует везде. В Америке огромная проблема с тюремным комплексом. В Австралии есть проблема с отношением к мигрантам. When you think about Pussy Riot, you should definitely remember that the, their main example and the main thing they are about is uh, being critical to their own government and holding their governments accountable and people should look at their own problems that surround them. For example, there is a huge problem with the prison industrial complex in the United States or a big problem with, with immigration in Australia and people should try to direct their attention and utilize, if they need them, some of our methods to try to solve and answer those questions in their own countries and communities. Мы, мы как раз э, стараемся не сильно так рефлексировать над тем, о чем мы сейчас сказали, потому что это все равно, что там корону в свою голову врастить. Мы стараемся какие-то новые вещи для себя открывать и как раз путешествуем для того, чтобы у нас появилось вот это критическое отношение к странам Запада, потому что многие из наших российских э, оппозиционных деятелей, они видят э, страны Запада в неком таком ореоле. Вот мы считаем, что это не совсем правильно, и проблема существует везде, и наша задача находить параллели и пытаться находить решения для них. And you know, we try to, uh, we do not try to reflect at the, pro at the uh, issue about Pussy Riot that you're, that you're that you've noticed about the popularity and the media attention too much. It's like sort of having a crown stuck to your head. We like travel because it allows us to see problems and uh, critical approaches that need to be used in other countries. Because for example, a lot of the people in the Russian democratic opposition back in Russia do have a problem with sort of idealizing the West and not seeing problems that arouse in Western countries. So travel and uh, knowledge of local activists and local problems allows us to not take this approach and to see problems in other countries as well. Да, и если, собственно, эту картинку обернуть сюда, если обернуть, посмотреть, как в Америке это может работать, мы слышали некоторые отголоски того, что когда Путин аннексировал Крым, некоторые, собственно, медиа здесь подавали это как некий сильный жест и Многие люди, которые не поддерживают Обаму, использовали образ Путина как образ сильного правителя. And you know, to reflect on how Putin's policies are perceived in the United States at some angle, when uh, Putin annexed Crimea at first, there were some conservative and Republican media in the United States that portrayed that as a very strong and bold move, and that uh, a lot of forces that are against and critical of President Obama, they really try to bring up Putin as a leader who can really, who really knows and can make a move. And you can imagine how we felt while reading all that. Okay, another question over here. Hi, um, I'm Molly Zuckerman. I'm a Russian studies major at Wesleyan University. And you brought up earlier the role of Alexei Navalny as kind of the head of an opposition movement. And I know that after his election last summer, there was some fracturing with his support within the movement because of his ideals on immigration and on um, nationalistic values. And I was wondering if you personally supported him and what you thought his future was in the Russian revolutionary movement. We support Navalny. Navalny. We have a little different question когда мы говорим о России, к несчастью, сейчас, вот, сейчас Путин нас вводит в каменный век. То есть мы сталкиваемся с такими базовыми вопросами, типа того, что, там, что стоит убивать за политическое мнение, либо не стоит. You know, uh, well, first of all, we do actively support Navalny. The problem with Putin is that he really brings the level of the political discussion to the Stone Age. Now we are really forced to answer not the questions you've aroused, but questions like should people be killed for voicing political opinions or should they not be? И поэтому мы поддерживаем Навального ровно потому, что он противостоит Путину и делает это достаточно эффективно. Мы добиваемся с ним общей цели. Цель — это площадка, на которой каждый может выразить свое мнение, не будучи при этом побитым, убитым, посаженным в тюрьму. И в тот момент, когда мы этой площадке достигнем, мы будем, скорее всего, в оппозиции к Навальному. Но пока мы вместе. And well, we do support Navalny as a very active and effective open opponent of Putin. And because we have one very strong common ground with him, that is the achievement in Russia of a political platform which will allow free democratic speech and voicing of various opinions. And when this platform, together with Navalny, hopefully will be reached, then 
we will most likely be in opposition with him and we will be able to move to question to discussing uh, immigration problems with him that we obviously do not agree with не близкой нам миграционной политики высказывает, чего большинство российских политиков избегают вовсе. Предпочитают and, замалчивать этот вопрос. И Навальный, как и другие российские политики, иногда имеет courage to address this very controversial in Russia issue, whereas other politicians try not to raise and analyze and voice their opinions on this issue at all. Good evening. Michael Levin, Huffington Post. I admire your courage very much. I'm wondering, are there any circumstances that you can envision under which Putin would be forced to leave office before his term ended? And if that were to happen, what so, sort of I'm government sorry. would come next? You know what? Is My that? apologies as a member of the media formerly. Journalists are not supposed to ask questions. Am I in Russia? It's, no, you're here. You're in a, in a, in a group of students who have the right to ask. So I'm very sorry, but uh, let's get a student, OK? Uh, there's one, is that a student or somebody from the Harvard community or? Just as long as you're not a journalist. Thank you, I'm not a journalist. Um, I'm a professor though, so I okay, hope that counts. Enough. Thank you. So, so at the trial, the judge in her sentencing document said that you were guilty of your crime and that it was motivated by religious hatred. But the judge also said that your religious hatred was motivated by feminism. And that is something that has not gotten, that part of the sentence did not get a lot of attention in the United States. And so I'm just wondering, what did you think of that part of her sentence? Well, for me, it was the most, uh, the most interesting and the brightest part of the sentence. <laughs> Не только это, там были высказывания некоторых охранников, которые э, говорили, что вот они выступали и перечисляли разные ругательные слова в адрес э, Бога. И когда мы их спрашивали, какие ругательные слова э, мы называли, они говорили феминистка. Not that, and there were also some security guards from the church that uh, during their testimonies in court, they were uh, basically giving a list of bad words that Pussy Riot used during their performance in the church. And when the judge asked, uh, in relation to God, bad words in relation to God. So, and when the judge asked, what bad, word, bad words did Pussy Riot use in relation to God? One of the security guards said, feminist. <laughs> As an example of a bad word. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, well, I guess we'll go back here, sir. Um, I'm Archie. I'm at the college. I was. Uh, this is more of a question for Nadja. Um, I know that you you had an e uh, letter exchange with the philosopher Slavoj Žižek while you were in prison. Would you mind telling us a bit about how that happened and what's said in those letters? Is that the philosopher? Yeah. Um, could you just two words explain who you're talking about? Just so the, the audience knows, this is a philosopher. Um, Slavoj Žižek is a pretty radical Marxist philosopher um, out of Eastern Europe. Um, and I believe that in your letters you discuss the continuity between Stalinism and 21st century capitalism. And that's why he thinks your group is such a terrifying force, because you actually pull out into the open the violence that's endemic in capitalism of all sorts. This could be a long answer, but uh, mm -hmm. Nadia? <laughs> Я не знаю, если совсем коротко, то вот недавно вышла книга, которая посвящена этой переписке. В общем, если кто-то хочет, может почитать, конечно. Потому что, честно говоря, это было полтора года назад. Я писала это на швейной машинке, и могу не все помнить о том, что я писала. Well, to start off very short, uh, this was, there was a book now out be, that portrays the letter exchange between me and uh, Slavoj. Uh, and this, all this happened one and a half years ago. And I wrote most of these letters next to a sewing machine in the prison factory. So I might not remember everything that was in them, but... Ну, для меня это был важный опыт. Как раз достижение какого-то общего поля между западными и между российскими критиками власти. Вот за тем, чтобы достигнуть это общее поле, я обратилась к переписке с Жижиком. И я надеюсь, что к чему-то мы пришли, но многое нам еще стоит преодолеть, продумать. И вот мы завтра встречаемся с Наумом в Чомске. 
В общем, большая встреча для нас, и я надеюсь, что мы придем к какому-то общему знаменателю, потому что очень важно все-таки это единение гражданских движений, активистских групп между нашими странами. For me, this was a, a very important experience because the main goal I had was to try to sort of find a universal field between Russian and Western thinkers and uh, analysts critical thinkers, critical thinkers uh, and to find a common uh, field for critical thinking against the government. And we think that uh, to some extent we succeeded in finding some common ground with him, but there's a long road ahead to do and a lot of things to, th to be thinked over and to be analyzed and to be produced in terms of critical thinking. And tomorrow we're going to be meeting with Noam Chomsky. And hopefully this will take this uh, ground, searching, uh, ground searching operation to the next step. Okay, could we go to the balcony again? Здравствуйте. Uh, Hello, my name is Marina Javrankova. I am uh, a student at the Kennedy School. I'm a master in public policy. Um, so my family moved here in 1991, like many other families from Russia. And I think my parents are representative of a group that definitely agrees with the content of what you're saying with your message, but perhaps not with the method. Um, and I think they're representative of a fairly large group of people both here and in Russia. Um, so my question is sort of how do you bridge the gap between these disparate groups, right? Between those that do agree with you and the way that you are delivering what you're saying and those that perhaps haven't found that method to be as conducive. No, они, эта группа людей действительно существует. И что тут можно сказать? Сейчас мы открыли СМИ, открыли НКО. Можно оценить, собственно, нашу деятельность в таком суперлегальном поле поле прав человека. Я думаю, что это безопасное поле, собственно, для всех, для тех, кто разделяет точку зрения на искусство, которую мы вот репрезентуем, и для тех, кто не разделяет. И можно оценивать нас не только как часть пусирает, но и как тех людей, которые пытаются добиться изменений в этой стране, в России разными методами. Well, obviously, obviously, this group uh, does exist, and it's, it is to some extent large. And well, besides our activities in Pussy Riot, we have also recently opened up a news outlet, and we have uh, we've started uh, NGO, a human rights NGO dedicated to prisoners' rights, and we also try to expand the way and broaden the amount of ways in which we try to influence and change the situation in Russia. So, besides our art activities with Pussy Riot that some people might not agree or might, uh, might not like. We also uh, look for a number of other much more conventional, much more calm and as you, you maybe can use the word much more legal ways to uh, <laughs> uh, work with the situation in Russia. And obviously uh, our work for those people that disagree with us on the views of art can be presented this side. Ну да, что, что касается искусства, я думаю, что венский акционизм акционисты до сих пор тоже, может быть, не очень понятны людям, но можно о них почитать и таким образом немножко расшириться представление о тех людях, которые занимаются искусством. Vienna Actionists, for example, of the 50s and early 60s are still also not understood by some people. But it's always good to sort of broaden your knowledge, get there and read about them and see how art has been developing over the 20th century. And this might give to some people a different perspective. Could we talk to the uh, gentleman who's texting over there? <laughs> <laughs> Sir? Yes. <laughs> Come on back. <laughs> Um, Добрый вечер, меня зовут Виталий, и у меня вопрос есть к Наде. Расскажите про Геру, про своего ребенка. Она поддерживает вообще вот какие-то вот... Do you want to do your own translation? Sure. I don't think it will be as good as Russian, but I can definitely try it. It's okay. So my name is Vitaly, and I had a question for Nadezhda regarding her child, whether her child... Who you bringing up? What kind of values you put into your child, and whether she shares your values, or she has... Or, is, or shares... Я думаю, что нужно оставить за ней право решать, какие ценности она будет разделять. Но определенно, что я объясняю все то, чем я занимаюсь. Она знает 
а, нашей политической деятельности еще с момента до того, как меня посадили в тюрьму. И когда Петю в конце 2011 года поместили в приемник для административно задержанных, я рассказывала ей, что ее папа сейчас вот на 10 дней в тюрьме, что он вышел на демонстрацию против Путина, а, но Путин не любит, когда выходит на демонстрации против него, поэтому он поместил его в тюрьму. Поэтому, собственно, когда в тот момент меня в марте посадили, в 2012 году, Гера уже представляла себе вот вот, в течение событий, что такое иногда случается. В общем, конечно, ей это не очень понравилось, но она была готова к этой ситуации. Well, you know, obviously, I think uh, she should in the future be able to choose her own values, but I do try to do a lot of political education, and even before uh, our arrest, she knew what was going on, and she's uh, six and a half, by the way. So, uh, for example, back in 2011, Nadi's referring to me, when I was, uh, as Gira's father, put to prison for a political protest for two weeks, uh, Nadi explained to Gira what was happening with me and why I was sent to prison for protesting against Putin. So when Nadia was sent to prison for a long time, uh, several months later, Gera was already ready for this kind, these kinds of situations. Although she wasn't too happy about that, but she was completely understanding of what was happening. Okay. Uh, yes, Katya. I was born in Russia. I'm a student of Harvard. И мой вопрос такой, а как вы думаете, где у вас больше сторонников, в России или на Западе, и почему? And to translate, uh, my name is Kat, I was born in Russia, but I'm now a student at Harvard College, and my question is, where do you think you have more uh, supporters, in Russia or in the West, and why? Когда мы говорим о сторонниках, наверное, не только в количественном смысле можно оценивать, но и в смысле того, что человек готов вложить в... То, как он поддерживает нас. Мы знаем определенное количество людей, которые лишились э, доступа в свои учебные заведения из-за того, что они поддерживали нас. Из-за того, что в 16 лет они впервые вышли на демонстрацию, и кто-то был исключен, кто-то был выгнан из школы. Они шли на это все. И для меня это действительно сопоставимо с тем количеством людей, которые почему-то поддерживают нас здесь. Но они поддерживают это в весьма в комфортных условиях по сравнению с теми, кто делает это в России. Well, you know, when you talk about supporters, you have to also think not just about the numbers, but also about the things that people had to endure by supporting us. For example, in Russia, people uh, were expelled from their schools or uh, went under prosecution for uh, supporting us, for going out on demonstrations, for actively voicing opinions in favor of us. And while the number of our, as you can say, active supporters might be higher in the West, you have to realize that people here can be support supporters in quite comfortable conditions. Whereas in Russia, if you're an active Pussy Riot supporter, often, often you have to endure some difficulties and go through some challenges. I think the most people who supported us from the beginning, when the West didn't know о нашем уголовном деле, не знал толком о том, чем мы занимаемся. Эти люди выходили, надевая балаклавы, к Таганскому суду, и их били, у них отнимали плакаты, и их обливали водой посреди мороза. И мне кажется, помощь, помощь этих людей, которые были и сейчас есть с нами все это время, они ничем не сравнится. Это... You know, the, uh, support... And the passion of people who came up to the Tagansky courtroom in Moscow that first arrested us in times when our case was completely unknown in the West, and they were uh, cold water was spilled on them, they were beaten up, they were attacked and assaulted, and their support at that early stage is something absolutely incomparable that does not compare to any type of support which came afterwards. So this is something that is very important and extremely dear to us. So, uh, it, time is running fast. Do we have five more minutes? How many more minutes would you say? Oh, 10, fabulous, okay. Uh, let's try to get through some questions here because um, there's so many people who are interested. Yes, sir. Yep. Hi, uh, Roman Turkovitsky. I'm a Russian-born uh, Harvard alum who was banned by Harvard to visit 
uh, our property. So I, my question is actually more of uh, an advice. So this advice, uh, I'm seeking advice from you as people who have been very politically active, and I think this will be interesting for many students who will have also been involved in political activism. So the quickly, uh, without going into too many details, the situation that we oftentimes encounter is that uh, institutions simply ignore activists. And so in terms of Harvard, the situation was that while I really appreciate that they invited you, while knowing that many people disagree with your viewpoints, what they do with uh, supporters of Putin, instead of actually establishing a dialogue, they simply invite people who played a major role in supporting uh, the current war in Ukraine, uh, so Russian artists, artists and musicians who signed the letter supporting essentially in March the occupation of Crimea and, and the war. Uh, now many students, many Harvard students, many uh, uh, faculty uh, proposed and asked Harvard either to cancel uh, this concert or to establish some sort of dialogue and discussion within uh, Harvard community. That uh, never happened, so Harvard administration uh, uh, refused. Uh, then, uh, in my situation, I was arrested and police lied blatantly on their uh, police report. And what's even worse, that Howard administration completely refused to even establish dialogue when there's very clear evidence that they lied. So here comes the question. Uh, <laughs> knowing that you are very creative in your choice of protest, what would you do? And a bit before, so, uh, but first of all, I forgot to mention that I just want to express uh, deep gratitude uh, for you coming here, but moreover for, uh, for being so brave and, and for being you, uh, for your actions in Russia and taking the consequences. And finally, to finish it up, uh, I also um, would like to address Harvard administration and uh, police department, if you're here. Uh, I am here illegally. So either please arrest me or please set up a public uh, hearing about the issues. And thank you so much. I'm looking forward to your answer. All right. <laughs> Во-первых, конечно, мы как только услышали о вашей ситуации, сразу всем сердцем вознадеялись на то, что Гарвард изменит свое решение, потому что это, конечно, сумасшествие. But obviously, once we heard of your situation, we really wish that Harvard would uh, change uh, its decision, because obviously it's a very, uh, it's a not a weird. right decision, a very weird decision, <laughs> to put it easy. Да, будь мы на вашем месте, возможно, мы бы сделали что-то более смелое, даже страшно представить, что в этом случае с нами случилось. Uh, if uh, we would be in your situation uh, somewhere else, uh, we would have probably done something stronger, and it's hard to imagine what would happen to what could have happened to us. Если вы говорите о методах, о методах протеста, ну я рекомендовала бы ролик какой-нибудь сделать, или может быть клип. Вы знаете, у вас есть такие замечательные люди здесь в Америке, из которых мы берем пример, вроде Стивена Колбера и well, you know, if you talk about the methods and the creative ways of doing it, in the United States you have uh, such great people as Stephen Colbert, for example, which give a good way, uh, go, good example of how you can approach those issues. So you could take them as an example. И естественно нам как жителям России хотелось бы получить более широкую картину, более широкое видение того, как американцы могут протестовать против войны в Украине. В том смысле, что Путин, когда вторгался в Крым, когда вторгался в Украину, он апеллировал к Америке, к ее внешней политике, к ее агрессивной внешней политике временами. And obviously it's very also very interesting how Americans can voice their uh, a disapprovement of uh, Putin's actions and Putin's war in Ukraine because when Putin started annexing parts of Ukraine and when he invaded Ukraine, he often appealed to America's foreign policy in the preceding decades. Mm, aggressive foreign policy. And um, <laughs> Putin прямо говорил такую вещь, США сами нагнули всех, а теперь возмущаются. And Putin, for example, uh, one of Putin's quotes, it's quite a strong quote, it says uh, the United States first 
bended everyone else over and now they are complaining about it. И в этом смысле хотелось бы видеть более широкую позицию гражданина США, который осуждает не только агрессивную политику Путина, но и осуждает агрессивную политику Соединенных Штатов Америки, которые тем самым дают пример всему миру, империалистическим настроенным политикам всего мира, каким образом нужно поступать с границами суверенных государств, которые находятся рядом с тобой либо на другом конце земного шара. For them, it would be also interesting to disapprove of America's aggressive foreign policies that really sort of feed into the uh, actions of other leaders who have these imperialist ambitions to not look at the borders of other countries and easily invade them and violate their own sovereignty. Мы считаем, что такая самокритика Соединенных Штатов, она поможет найти э, точку для переговоров между этими странами, потому что в них гораздо больше схожего, чем различного. И это столкновение, оно надуманное, оно надумано нашими лидерами. Мы должны пытаться найти общие проблемы и пути, как их преодолеть. Uh, areas and common questions and common grounds between the United States and Russia, because in reality we have much more similar things than we than things that separate us. So this is a very good way of basically finding a common conversation, leading it, and actually figuring out a common way to solve the problems we both, as two big countries, share. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, probably. Yes, please. Uh, Hi, I'm Alice. Uh, I'm a freshman at Harvard College. And first, thank you so much for being here. Uh, secondly, uh, many people have criticized your method, even as they agree with your uh, message. But my question is, do you think that art, and specifically punk music, actually make civic uh, disobedience more accessible to the larger population, to all segments and classes of society? Uh, because in the past, uh, civil d disobedience movements have often been, uh, have often been limited to a small core group of educated individuals. I don't know, it's not our idea. Ну да. И образование раньше тоже было мало кому, собственно, ну, доступно меньшему количеству людей, так что... Well, you know, before education was really limited to a much smaller group of people, so we think this is a very natural process, and obviously we weren't the ones that uh, made it up. Is that the last word? Последнее <laughs> слово. Okay. Последнее слово хотелось бы, чтобы, чтобы вот этого человека не арестовала полиция. Вот. Это настоятельное последнее слово. Word, man, example, police, and... И пусть его вернут в Гарвард. Well, um, thank you. Спасибо большое. Спасибо огромное. Thank, thank you, you very much. It was really interesting and, and glad to have you here. I hope people enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. Um, Masha, Nadia, and Peter, our translator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Reminder. Just a reminder, please remember to return your translation devices if you have them. Thank you.